Okay, so next up, uh, we've got a presentation that's very relevant uh, for this period in time. Uh, we've got Mac McClarty and Sejuna Verma from MuleSoft, and they're going to talk to us about a COVID-19 API case study. So Matt Mc is uh, MuleSoft's global leader for API strategy. In this role, Matt helps our customers take maximum advantage of their API opportunities through strategic guidance, sharing organizational practices, and the development of API ecosystems. And he's based in Vancouver, Canada. So Jenna is um, a product leader at MuleSoft. Um, she works on the developer tooling product lines, focusing on AnyPoint Studio and API Kit, and growth strategies for AnyPoint platform and its launches. Her passion is helping users utilize APIs to connect to their most crucial systems. If she's not looking at product development, she can be found photographing and learning the piano. So with that, I will hand over to Matt and Sejena to uh, talk to you about their COVID-19 API case study. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, so yeah, our, our story here at API Days is really about how uh, I mean, obviously, it's a very current topic, right? COVID-19 is truly a, gl a global crisis uh, that unfortunately we're, we're still going through and will be going through for some time. Um, but this is also generally a story about how we can take data sources and really have APIs be a vehicle for providing value through that data and, and exchanging value through the APIs. So you know, I I just going to give a little a little preamble here and then hand it over to Sanjana to to really give the meat of the story, but I think it's something that's very topical for those of us in the API community that that so much data is now being collected out there in the uh, in the industry. Um, you know we're we're seeing that uh, that every day we have uh, in, increasing amounts of. Uh, of of data that just you know dwarfs the day before. I think I think every year we produce more data than was ever produced in the in the years before that. And so for a lot of organizations, as we um, uh, as we are dealing with this massive accumulation of data, the challenge is not so much uh, how do we create more data. It's really how do we sift through all these piles and piles of data in order to um, find the insights. Um, just give it one second here. Sorry, I think we're having a little bit of a technical difficulty right now. So um, I'm just going to bring my screen up. Everyone can see that. So really, that that is the issue, right? We're having uh, we're having all sorts of issues with uh, with with dealing with finding the, the insights from the data. And you know, I wrote a blog on this recently. When it comes to APIs and how APIs play in the data ecosystem, uh, there's a lot of ways that APIs can help in dealing with data. You've got the opportunity to use APIs as a way of finding data, as a way of sourcing data. As a as a real time touch point to integrating data. Also, as we go through uh, so much, uh, you know, so much of the the data that we process and analyze through machine learning algorithms, through other analytic uh, mechanisms, the capabilities that we expose through APIs can really be infused with those data based insights. But I think the real value comes, and we've seen this in the digital landscape where so much value is being delivered through user experiences, through new digital user experiences. And, and so when you're able to incorporate all that data into those user experiences, that's where you're really generating maximum value. And um, you know, I think, I think that uh, it's, we need to think about that. It's like we have all this data, but we can't use it and can't get to it. It's like the old, if a tree falls in the forest, right? No one's around. You're not going to get any value from data that's not actually put to use. And that's where I think the intersection of API strategy, data strategy, AI strategy can really deliver new value. And when we think about this concept of value with data, I think it's uh, quite useful to look into um, uh, you know, really con contextualizing the data through APIs. 
And you know, Peter Morville is a big, a big giant, wrote the information architecture book. In there, he had kind of a, a, a Venn diagram showing you've got user and content, but context is just as important in there. And he expanded on that later, put together the UX honeycomb, which really talks about value at the center and how in the, in the case he was writing was really content. But in, in our case, we can look at data in the same way. Value is generated, I think, and I think especially for APIs through how useful the data is, and in, in, in this case, how useful the API is, but also how usable the API is. APIs being a direct channel of developer engagement, usability is key because usability can speed up access to data, speed up access to solution development. So that's, I think that's really the framing that I look at this, uh, uh, when I look at this story that we're about to go through, I, I really see it as a story about how we can bring data in and then expose it through APIs, APIs and all the other user experience touch points. And now I'm gonna hand it over to Sanjan to tell you the, the story about how we did this specifically with COVID data. Thanks, Matt. Yes, I'm really excited to be sharing the story with you all from a nighttime in San Francisco where the air quality is much better. But something that we had learned at that time was that technology was allowing us to synthesize a lot of data very, very quickly, and for the first time, an entire global database of people trying to analyze COVID-19 data was all happening at the same time for us in March. So we came together to actually try and do something around that, see if we could power, uh, provide trusted COVID-19 data to empower and inform civic leaders, business administrators, and general citizens around everything related to COVID-19. And this is the problem that we were seeing. There were data sources that said the same thing with different tags or attribute names. For example, one data source, like the World Health Organization might have called it infected. With the CDC, they might have called it hospitalized. And the New York Times was reporting it as sick. The fact of the matter is, after analysis with industry and medical experts, all of these data sources were saying the same things with those different tags and attributes. Might have been date represented or date, mortality or death. In either ways, all of these things were saying the exact same data and reporting the same numbers, just described ever so differently. So we at MuleSoft, Salesforce and Tableau sat down together and devised a unique standard data model that could map each data set's unique attributes into a standardized list of attributes. Then we decided to expose all of it through a series of APIs and visualizations. So taking all of that tremendous amount of data that's in circulation around COVID-19, we were able to capture key metrics like new cases, survival rates, resource utilization, and tests. And given the importance of that data, we knew it was paramount to provide trustworthy, secure, and easily accessible data to anyone who needed it. So we created the COVID-19 data platform, which is a tightly regulated data pipeline, warehouse, and series of APIs that can help organizations make the critical decisions or data analysis to curb the spread of the virus and determine how to best move forward. So it was available for a lot of different users at absolutely no charge. And we worked through it in a very, very unique way. So I'm gonna take you through the pipeline and see where we go from there. So first of all, the platform works by identifying and validating key data sets. So we solicit important and relevant data sources that can be added to the global COVID-19 data warehouse. And right now, the platform includes data from the New York Times, the European CDC, the COVID tracking project, among many, many others. But the, this data was validated by domain experts and curated to ensure these data sources are accurate and reliable. Next, we ingest and normalize the data. So it's fed through a secure application network with reusable APIs and processes. This includes an ingestion API to get all of the data and an egress API as core connecting pieces of infrastructure. This way we can work with partners to contribute data and allow anyone to consume it openly via REST APIs. Next, data sets are mapped and stored in a normalized model. And then it's consumed and distributed across all types of people to get started with. We provided both visualizations on Tableau 
and an API that connected directly to our data warehouse, both of which provided the exact same information. So that way, internal product teams, ISV partners, other stakeholders like government agencies or nonprofits and the general public could go to these places and actually make the decisions that they needed to. They could get started with the data in a multiple of different ways. So I'm gonna take you through each part of this platform in a lot more detail because it's pretty unique and exciting to see what we were able to do. First of all, let's see what kind of data gets curated. We looked at public health data, like case data, infections, death count, symptoms, predictive models. We looked at other public data like non-pharmaceutical intervention data, or in layman terms, government policies that are in effect to help curb the spread of COVID-19. And then lastly, the data that we're working on sourcing is medical resource data, like PPE, ventilators, bed capacity, personnel, availability, et cetera. What we realized though, is that each one of the data sources were saving manual PDFs and uploading it to their native websites. So these CSV or Excel files were uploaded directly onto the customer's websites or the data source provider or GitHub, and we needed to connect to it dynamically instead of having to go every single day downloading the CSV for manual processing. So between the different types of web service APIs, that made it very obvious for us to go with the REST API because the operability of using different specification types, and we knew that we were being driven with uh, simple functions and complex data. So REST would be the best decision here. And this was supposed to be web accessible rather than a web service. So that actually helped knock gRPC as an API type for us. The next thing we're looking at is currently an OData API for ourselves internally. We want to connect to core systems within Tableau, within MuleSoft, within Salesforce and other partners. And the other part is that we had this data model that underpinned our entire interaction model and OData actually helps us go through the entire publication and web client request model that we needed to. So as a result, we knew we should be building this OData type API as soon as we could prove out the POC with the rest. Lastly, we've been looking at a GraphQL API because now what we're seeing is that we have hundreds, if not thousands of uh, gigabytes of data here. And we want to figure out what's going to be the best way to allow anybody to build their own formula to access the data that they need. So once we were able to understand that, we also looked at how the data was coming in. As I mentioned, it was mostly CSV. We also had a few unique cases where the data source provider also provided the data in a JSON format. So if all the data we were getting uh, in ingress was JSON or CSV, we decided to normalize the outbound on JSON. We also know from previous experiences that XML processing is very heavy and the XML payload sizes were much larger than the JSON or CSV payload sizes. Unless we were gonna go with a SOAP service, we wouldn't want to be using XML. So we kept processing at the mule layer against XML. And like I mentioned, on the outbound side, everything was JSON. So that way we could build Tableau visualizations really quickly with that and have REST APIs available right away. Next, we built the application network of reusable processes. And we had a few principles here. One was to maximize open consumption. So broaden the expectations of the API's availability and usability. We also went cloud first on our deployment model to ensure that it was highly available, reliable and scalable for as much as we needed it. So let me show you the application network and how we were able to actually build it out. We started at the system layer, actually identifying the systems or the data source providers that we needed to go to and establishing direct connection to them. Then we also created a connector to our data warehouse, which in this case was Snowflake. After that, we created the actual processes that we needed. There was a certain amount of queuing that we needed to do to ensure that we weren't spamming and sending too much data in mass. We also had a data aggregation to ensure that we could have the API be presentable no matter when we needed it, but ready to be available in our warehouse upon retrieval. And then a data synchronization process API. 
This was with the scheduler, so that way we could run this entire application network regularly multiple times a day. Because the reality was these data source providers were publishing data at their own pace. It wasn't always at the same time. And we wanted the data to be available right away. And in the case that our scheduler didn't pick up this information, we also created an experience API. This one would allow us to dynamically trigger the entire application network to run if we needed it. So this architecture that we developed though was revised seven times in four weeks. That's how quickly we were trying to go and how quickly we stumbled over our own feet sometimes. We sized the architecture twice to understand cloud deployment performance. And we didn't exactly look at the number of custom components that we were gonna build off the bat because we wanted to maximize our potential for reusing the APIs we were building. So like I mentioned, we took this API led or API first approach for the overall application structure. Then we used the API design first principle, AKA building out with API specifications. And with that, we started having a lot more components to reuse. We started templatizing our specifications to include HTTP standard response messages and error messages and authentication behaviors. We defined common error structures like the way client details and authentication would be handled. We also had a mocking service that was used really quickly and that helped us rapidly prototype even more quickly. We were trying to go live in a less than a month with everything I just showed you. So at the end of that entire sprint, we had 15 API specifications with two reusable API fragments, all pointing to one master library with the rules of the data model. So now when, let's get into the implementation phase that we had. We had three and a half weeks to implement what we had just put together as an architecture diagram. And 65% of our time was spent nailing transformations to make sure the data was actually human readable. And then the other 35% was on testing our applications and making sure it was actually a usable API at the end of it. This was incredibly important for us because we as technologists were struggling to understand each individual CSV file. We had to ensure that our data that we were able to push out via the API in the normalization way wouldn't have that exact same problem. It needed to be digestible by literally anyone. So data weave and M unit here were where the bulk of our time was spent. We got out of the box streaming that helped us get the data consistently without having to worry about performance. And then we started to identify a lot of reusable functions. So data weave helped us get those reusable functions. We wrote about 40 when it came to it to also help us execute native SQL generation as well as scripting. Then when it came to MUnit, we were able to decide whether or not our connections were being made to the data sources. And if the application logic blocks were correct, was it actually pushing the data? Was anything being rejected? And once that cleared, we had defined a way to automate our user acceptance testing. And that for us sped up our entire deployment process. So we got to this position really, really quickly where the data sets were quickly mapped and stored in the warehouse. But consuming and distributing the data is just as important. Here, we realized that deploying our APIs did not mean going live with the entire data pipeline. Deploying was a lot more clicks than code and it's a lot of context switching. And in fact, we rolled back twice after we, even though we did an immense amount of testing, we saw that we needed to do more quality control and actual explanation about what was in our API. So this is kind of what happened. We had started with a really, really manual process at the top left. Then that helped us understand whether or not the visualization was correct for that individual data source on that day. But when we started to make it a repeatable process, we need to do those checks and balances consistently against the API's responses and against the visualization. So this last mile effort on making sure the data was clean and readable ended up being another week and a half of work. Until this point, the entire pipeline had removed the need now for us to manually upload the files, but it hadn't removed the need for us to check the data. 
So getting that usability, that readability was really, really huge for us. This is what happened when we tried to share the APIs. There were a few behavioral changes that we made. When we published a live API implementation endpoint on any point exchange, we also saw that production uh, URLs weren't necessarily available by default, and we had to change that for ourselves. Then we also had to nail how we could engage or publicize or even advertise our API. And so many of those challenges were simply around explaining what we had done again and again and again. And that was a really interesting thing to ensure that the technology we built was really cool. But if somebody like my brother in university couldn't understand it, we had a problem in our hand. So we spent a lot of time reviewing the artifact and the API and document things that we were changing. So as you can see over here on the left side, the first thing we had noticed was we put an open implementation production endpoint, but it still said request access for an open API. That didn't make sense for us. After we were able to take that and remove the URLs that are provided by default and point to our live implemented endpoint, we saw that once the redundancy had removed, had been removed, we got a lot more traction on our API. And the verbiage on the API portal had to be really clear and really succinct, as well as get a lot of legal review for the dialogue. So keeping all of that in mind, we had to ensure that our API could be useful at the end of the day. And I'm really excited to show you that we were able to hit that. We survived a minor DDoS attack. It was uh, my humor led me to say, I can't believe we even built an API that somebody would want to hack, but that really helped us. We're now averaging something around 600,000 unique API requests a week with about 30 to 40,000 unique views to our Tableau visualizations. So that means taking that API first approach created two unique opportunities for us. We had the ability to see all of the different APIs that we would build and then give the data in the format that would help the person who needed it. Some people just need a dashboard and need to see the world map and see how COVID is progressing. Other people need to see it in the format of raw data as a JSON format. So that way maybe they can build their own perhaps custom contact tracing solution. Or maybe they just wanna build a cool web application as a hackathon project. These were all use cases that we saw pop out for the COVID-19 data platform. This is how our pipeline had started. We had three data sources that were delivered in three weeks with another two pending. It's now been five months since we embarked on this journey. We now have over 15 data sources. We started our API-led approach with just, again, these simple three data sources plus connection to our data warehouse. We have over 15 system APIs now. And the lessons learned here are incredibly high for us. We saw that there's an appetite from data providers to work with us because we were able to have that con uh, consistent standardized data model. That means that if contextualized data is in high demand, we need to make sure that every single piece of that data is readily accessible and understandable. Then data needs to be consistent as a result of that. So you need to ensure that it can be delivered in whatever ecosystem at any given moment in time. And lastly, once it's been delivered, it actually needs to be readable, it actually needs to be understood. And making sure that data is both human, uh, human and machine readable continues to be one of our biggest struggles, but continues to be an incredible area for growth for all of us. There's so much that we can do here around data and data management all through APIs that it's an incredibly powerful time to be in, especially with COVID-19. As we were building out that global COVID-19 data warehouse with, in reality, the entire technology community, we got to see how these different faceted interpretations all come together to actually create some change and create some action. So that's the end of our uh, presentation. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm going to invite Matt to come back and we can discuss a little bit more about some of the lessons learned around building this immense data pipeline and series yeah. of APIs. Awesome. And that was, a, I, I love the story. I think, uh, actually I was looking into it today. I think there are actually two, I'm here in Canada, 
there are two Canadian provinces, Ontario and BC, which are actually using the, the platform, which is great. We like it. I think, I think you had, I think New South Wales is providing one of the data sources that we're, we're including. Yeah, so we have, yeah, we have an, a lot yeah, of incredible Australia. granular data. Exactly. We, uh, Australia is coming in with some really highly detailed uh, data and information. Um, we've been looking and partnering with different governments, such as the universe, uh, sorry, the state and province of British Columbia as well. It's a, it's a really interesting and unique time because everybody wants to share the information, but needs to do so securely. But they also need to make sure that if data is shared, it's not interpreted wrong and they're grounds for liability. And I, I think this, uh, I think, you know, where I was going earlier in the presentation, talking about this feedback loop, I think we're experiencing this too, right? Where where you, you go in, you know the data, there's gonna be people wanting to use the data. You can't anticipate everything that happens. So I think it's fair to say, right, we're in that phase now where we're looking to see who's using it, what use cases they have. Maybe we augment the data with other sources of data or more completeness of data. And then that becomes kind of a, a flywheel to to try and keep improving it. And I think I think from a product manager standpoint in APIs, uh, that this finding the finding the right way of getting consumer information, consumer intelligence around who wants to use it, where the value is, I think is a really important part. And I think it, it's a little bit of anticipation and a little bit of organic observation. Totally. Uh, I completely agree with everything that you said. The, what I will say that we've noticed more often than not is how much rapid prototyping is happening with these APIs. And because people are trying to make sense of it, they need, they're they wanting to see trends over time. So they're actually doing dynamic retrieval based on dates as part of you know the parameters with the API. Then they're also trying to make sense of that information and try and track growth over time, either whether you know, to scare themselves as to COVID-19 getting bigger or give them some hope that it's actually getting better. Yeah. It's all yeah. on you. Yeah, I think, I, think the, uh, I think the data focused API space is a little, I think we're starting to see some of the unique aspects of that. Whereas if you're more process oriented, task oriented, you may wanna put more guardrails around things. But, and maybe over time, as we get more observation and, and have a, a better understanding of how it's being used, we could do the same thing. But I know that that we've got uh, different flexibility mechanisms in there, and you know, it's a great. Agree. It's a it's a great story. So you know, I, I I'm I'm always uh, I'm, I'm so you, you guys did such an awesome job. Thanks. It is, a, it, is a, it is a great story, and um, uh, it, what a fantastic contribution uh, to the world and, and something so incredibly important. How does it feel personally to be involved in in that? That you, your involvement and your contributions may actually lead to a solution uh, for this pandemic. Honestly, I think that's the first CNN-like question I've ever got. I have to say, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say that. Um, in all honesty, we didn't expect it to uh, get as big as it did. Um, I literally, when we had that DDoS attack within eight hours of us going live with that API, I was even surprised that somebody found the API and wanted to hack us. Like the biggest honor of my life as a technologist. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. But honestly, I like knowing that technology can be widely interpreted and can be shared so that it can be understood. If we keep it to ourselves, we're not doing any good, honestly. I'll also say that there are two really interesting questions in the Q&A that are relevant to our experience, if we don't mind talking about that as well. Oh, no. Oh, I just noticed. Yes, there are new ones that didn't come up. Okay. Sorry about that. Uh, so yes, did the data sources schema change at any point after you started collecting data? The data sources schema actually grew. So we started off looking again at four or five data sources raw, and then we went to medical and healthcare industry experts to actually try and see if we could get the entire broad range of data. And we started off with maybe 300 attributes and that quickly magnified in detail to about 450. But the good thing about having that much detail is that we actually stopped needing to remap every single time. So it would grow in either direction, 
as opposed to being ripped and replaced every single time. Um, that we could have only done with the help of healthcare and medical experts. There was no way we as, you know, Silicon Valley tech people could have done that on our own. Right. Great. And the and the, the last question is, are the data normalization mappings done manually or were there, was there any automation to help with that mapping? Uh, the inter so it happened in two parts. There was one part that was manual, one part that was automatic. The manual part was actually going and understanding the data that was being provided. Then uh, once we understood what was coming out from each source, we mapped that manually. And then once those associations were made, we automated it such that every single day onwards from that point in time, that mapping would happen automatically and get stored. Okay, terrific. Well, I think that uh, that brings us to time now. So uh, fantastic. Uh, thanks for the great presentation. I'm sure people, you know, there's a little bit of time left at the conference if people want to uh, visit your vendor uh, vendor uh, stand and they could do that in the Partners Village. Uh, but thank you so much for a great presentation. Right. Thank you thanks for having so us. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye.